Of the 30% of African workforces that are concentrated in the informal economy, young people account for a quarter um, of that constituency. And this is worrying for their own welfare in terms of finding um, jobs and other opportunities, um, rising incomes, but also because I think of another pattern that hasn't gotten enough attention in the region. And that's because of Africa's also declining mortality rates, which is, is great news. Um, Africa is actually gonna have the highest absolute number of people above the age of 60 by 2050. And that creates tremendous pressure on dependency ratios um, in the region. A dependency ratio is the number of working age people um, who have to support either older or younger uh, people. So with both declining fertility in the region and declining mortality rates, the composition of Africa's dependency ratio is gonna lean much more towards supporting older people in the future. So uh, trends are already suggesting that kind of population pyramids um, in just a few decades are going to be more similar to Asia and Latin America. Uh, and that, that's, that's concerning when you think about the weakness of African pension systems um, and social security networks, that today's youth who will be supporting in a few decades their parents and their grandparents, uh, if they can't find jobs today, how will they be able to fulfill that role? And this prospect can obviously lead to disgruntlement and grievances um, that can at times uh, encourage youth to be mobilized into potentially destabilizing protests and anti-government behavior. And that leads us to the, the last megatrend I'll discuss, um, which is considering technological innovation in the region and the way it can be mobilized for both good and bad intentions. Um, and I think this is the domain that's really one of the hardest to get our minds around. Um, because it's really kind of spiraling very quickly out of our control, not just in Africa, but globally. Um, we're really trying to get a handle on it. There's so many possibilities now with artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, um, gene editing, robotics, drones, et cetera. Um, and we've seen the benefits of such technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was really essential for keeping food systems working. We're seeing a lot of great technological innovation in election management systems, also in, in the higher education sector. In places like Kenya, portals like eCitizen have really improved interoperability across systems and sectors, allowing citizens to go to one place to file tax returns, apply for birth or marriage certificates, register a business, et cetera. Um, and many countries are really utilizing technology to improve taxation, um, using electronic vouchers for fertilizer and seed subsidy programs. So I think these uses can really expand efficiency, enhance transparency of both the public and private sector, um, and, and hopefully enhance citizen trust in government responsiveness. But we know there's a flip side, as I alluded to with some of the other megatrends. Um, there is potential for misuse, uh, for misinformation, and even uneven technology access that can further exacerbate inequalities. So reliable internet connectivity, for instance, this is essential uh, for any type of use of, well, most of the technologies I talked about. Um, internet penetration, though, in Africa remains quite low. It increased from 12 to 30%, according to the World Bank, over the last decade. But this is still much lower than the 74% internet penetration that we see in G20 countries. Um, and we have about 90% internet penetration here in the US. So the level has been growing, but it's still quite low. Um, in addition, probably not surprisingly, we still see vulnerable groups in rural areas being the most disadvantaged to digital opportunities. Um, a survey by, by a great company called Afrobarometer, um, they found only 17% of self-employed workers in rural areas use the internet compared to 44% among their urban counterparts. And in addition, a lot of the digital, digital innovation we've been hearing about has really been concentrated in just a handful of cities across the continent. Um, the top ones are Cape Town, Lagos, Johannesburg, Nairobi, and Cairo. So it's very kind of concentrated engagement. Um, about 85% of venture capital funding for Africa's startups went to only four countries. And in addition, we know internet connectivity is very much dependent on energy access, reliable energy access, um, with the re which the region grapples with uh, quite a lot. Um, my husband is South African. His family and friends are continuously um, you know, dealing with kind of long uh, blackouts, um, and there's really kind of no end in sight about when those are going to end. 
So current scenarios suggest you need $100 billion um, to invest in infrastructure, in energy, um, in C-bands, um, internet cables, to ensure that there is universal internet broadband access in Africa. So these four megatrends, they, they clearly intersect with each other. Um, as you know, as alluded to the impacts of climate change with urbanization, for instance, but they very much intersect with security issues in different ways. Um, they can at times create economic grievances that make certain populations more attracted to extremist and violent groups. They may generate perceptions of political exclusion and lack of voice that lead to distrust of the state uh, and perhaps the formation of certain extremist groups. So, you know, if we take, for instance, going back to climate change, um, I, I already discussed, you know, the, the impacts on land scarcity, uh, water scarcity, um, how that may exacerbate food insecurity and drive internal displacement and cross-border migration. Many point to the Lake Chad Basin as a dramatic example of this. The lake provides drinking water, um, supports economic activity and the livelihoods of over 30 million people. Um, but the size of the lake has decreased by 90% since the 1960s due to many factors, including recurrent drought, climate change, uh, overuse of water resources, and poor enforcement of environmental regulations. So consequently, we see upwards of 30 million people now who are dependent on this lake now competing for these rapidly depleting resources. And this confluence of factors has led some experts to, to claim that the increase in farmer pastoralist conflicts that we've seen in the region um, has, has been exacerbated by this competition for, for land and water resources. And addressing these issues has then been further complicated by the Boko Haram insurgency. So it's a very complex network um, between all these factors. They're very endogenous to each other. More broadly, one study suggests that a 0.5% increase in local temperatures increases the risk of conflict by 10 to 20%, which is huge. Um, there is some caution about driving automatic links between conflict and climate um, because there is some tendency to focus on countries that are already in conflict and say, oh, well, they're also facing a, a climate shock. You know, So um, the direction of causation is very difficult to uncover. Um, and increasingly, the consensus is that while, uh, con while climate change exacerbates uh, conflict, it's not necessarily the main driver. Um, it tends to uh, be worsened in, not surprisingly, contexts of low socioeconomic development and where you have low state capacity. The low state capacity and I think states' uh, lack of full sovereignty over the territories that they govern really creates a vacuum in which insurgent and extra legal actors can gain a foothold. Evidence shows that the large gaps in service provision left by inadequate responses by Somalia's authorities to drought um, and chronic food insecurity were filled by Al-Shabaab. And this not only increased the group's legitimacy, but also increased its recruitment. So, so it can have really kind of um, strong impacts. And the relationship can also go the other way, um, where potential conflicts can af affect the pace of these megatrends. Um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change recently highlight that militaries generate upwards to 6% of greenhouse gas emissions. And conflict itself is a major source of emissions. If you think about conflicts that result in burning of fields, the destruction of cities, uh, if we looked at what's happening in Khartoum at the moment, um, and you think about the rebuilding of such cities um, generates huge costs on the environment. Technolo technological innovation as well um, is generating a lot of concern about the intersection with conflict. The rise of so many technological innovations so quickly cannot feasibly, and I don't know if we would want them to be, uh, just contained by the state. We're seeing uh, private sector civil society and also extra legal non-state actors um, using these different technologies for both good and for bad. Um, and there's a potential, real potential, I think, for misinformation, increasing the likelihood that small scale disputes could really escalate to large scale conflagrations. The youth bulge as well is another uh, area where we can see a major intersection with conflict, especially in urban areas, grievances over resource scarcity in urban slums, um, and the lack, the perceived lack of government responsiveness in these areas has led youth to form vigilante groups um, in many, many cities across the region that become really difficult to then rein in 
over time, right? And they can be seen as parallel security forces. Um, and the longer they're in place, uh, the more difficult it becomes to reassert the authority of, of the state security forces. So I think overall, there's a concern that many of these megatrends can be a source of insecurity when the state is lack, when the state is perceived to um, lack uh, adequate presence and legitimacy by its citizen. So I have five minutes remaining, and I'm going to now turn to so what are some kind of policy implications? What should we be thinking about? And here I'm going to draw on um, some work from the Brookings Institution publication called Foresight Africa. Um, the 2023 Foresight Africa report is available on the Brookings website, so I encourage any of you who are interested, you can freely download the report. Um, it talks about many of these megatrends and many more, um, so I'll just focus on a few recommendations we see um, in that report and elsewhere um, and, and highlight three things. I think capacity, coordination, and inclusion are essential principles going forward when dealing with these megatrends. Um, I think on inclusion, we really need to ensure that excluded voices are heard so that grievances don't escalate, they don't fester, escalate, and destabilize regions. On youth, for example, there's really a need for better parliamentary, better legislative representation. Um, youth have had very little participation in their legislative bodies. The Interparliamentary Union finds that um, youth in Africa represent only 1.8% um, of their parliamentarians. So we're seeing a lot of youth agendas, youth policy projects, um, but the concern here is that these youth-focused policy agendas are, are not really being directed by those who will be most affected by them. Um, so involving more youth might involve, for instance, reducing nomination fees um, for political parties to find ways for, for youth to be able to afford to compete um, in the political system. Capacity, um, the second principle is, is paramount. Um, we need properly capacitated and incentivized public sectors. And this may involve kind of a shifting in emphasis of public sector funding to ensure that civil servants who are hired have the skills to, to get ready for the future, uh, deal with these megatrends. Um, and in this regard, there might be a need for more engagement with the donor community who often dismiss uh, spending money on civil servants as wasteful. And in fact, actually, we need properly remunerated civil servants um, who have these high skills um, who, who can confront the future. I think this is particularly key for climate change and technology because we just don't know how these trends are going to proceed. With urbanization and the youth, we can look to how other regions have, have dealt with these trends. But we're all operating in the dark a little bit with the technological innovation and climate change. Um, so on technology, there needs to be a lot more training on regulatory needs within the public sector in a way that encourages citizen trust of the state. Um, more importantly, there needs to be huge investments in technology regulation enforcement within the public sector and alignment with the private sector on these issues. So there's about 43 out of 46 uh, sub-Saharan African countries that have ICT ministries but there's still minimal progress on robust um, regulatory and legislative frameworks to deal with issues like data privacy and cybersecurity. So without these provisions, citizens can be much more reluctant to use these new technologies, which do have great benefits, can enhance um, transparency and efficiency. And citizens without this, this kind of trust um, may fear that these technologies will become vulnerable to manipulations. So the absence of cross-cutting data protection and privacy frameworks has been seen to undermine public uh, confidence in attempted rollouts of digital ID systems across the continent in places like Uganda, Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria. And capacity is also paramount for the climate megatrend I mentioned as well. Um, foresight and climate modeling capabilities in the, in the region are very weak at the moment. Um, on climate, also early warning systems and preparedness systems are key. The rate of implementing multi-hazard early warning systems is lower in Africa than any other region. This was one of the findings that also came out of the, the Africa chapter of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC report. But we nonetheless know from existing research where climate hotspots exist in the region. Um, so there, there needs to be more attention to, you know, if we know where these hotspots are, we know what some of the challenges might be, 
Um, how can we already be prepared for population displacements, for instance? Um, how do different neighboring countries work with each other to anticipate these trends? In addition, on the climate side, we need investment in African research institutions. Um, a really, I think, fascinating study uh, uncovered recently that of the over 1.5 trillion US dollars of research grants um, that have been allocated around the world to focus on climate change research between 1990 and 2020, only 14% of that money went to African institutions to do research on climate change in Africa. Okay, most of the funding went to European or North American institutions. And this is extremely problematic since it suggests local African scientists views and their expertise is not being properly exploited and, and learned from. But it also suggests that African institutions of higher education need to be reformed to address uh, some of these mega, mega trends um, and particularly um, more robust to deal with climate science. Finally, many of these issues require coordination, both horizontal across ministries and vertical coordination um, between national governments and subnational governments, whether cities, districts, states, or provinces. Um, you know, several governments in Africa have adopted presidential delivery units to identify key outcomes that they want to achieve that, that span many different sectors. Um, and I think a similar type of idea could be applied to create um, futures groups within governments. Here in the U.S., the National Intelligence Council has a futures group. Um, and you could think about having this maybe at the regional level, at the ECOWAS, SADC, EAC level, um, to help regional governments anticipate these megatrends, forecast different scenarios, and coordinate with each other on viable responses. And such units could also benefit from having an intelligence uh, unit as well to help them gather on best gather information on best practices from around the world to address these mega trends. So, and then at the broader level, um, addressing these climate security risks really requires a rethinking of climate governance and diplomacy in Africa and elsewhere. Um, the current policy architecture on these issues at the national, regional, and international level remains very siloed. You know, a climate change uh, community and the security community don't often talk to each other. Um, they're dealt with by different institutions and in different forums. And so the conversations continue to remain very disconnected. Instead, we need much more systems thinking uh, and approaches. So these are all I, re I recognize extremely difficult, difficult tasks. Um, some of the ways of implementing them and some country examples are offered in this foresight report that I mentioned. Um, but I think so some of these interventions will really need to be prioritized to make the continent ready to, to confront the future and, and forge its own path forward. So let me stop there and hand over to my colleague.